Hi Spring fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. In this installment, we're going to wrap up our series looking at all things at controller, and we're going to focus specifically on GraphQL. Now, bear in mind, we've already done fairly recently a video on GraphQL, so I'm not going to rehash all of that, and I definitely encourage you to check that out for the broader, bigger context. But suffice it to say that GraphQL uh, is the latest and greatest addition to the uh, Spring at Contro Controller uh, portfolio. It is a technology built on top of the GraphQL Java project, which is mature, GA, widely available, widely used, etc. So widely used, in fact, that it's uh, the implementation that Twitter uses to power their GraphQL API. So you know it scales. What we've done is working with them in tandem with them, we've built a component model on top of the GraphQL Java project uh, that supports Spring uh, sort of use cases, idiomatic spring component models, and, and so on. We integrate it with Add Controller. Now, Graph GraphQL itself was born uh, at Facebook, uh, sorry, Meta, in 2012. The tension that they faced at the time was they had lots of different services, and these services had their own data layers, uh, but those services were naturally separated. There were individual services. And the clients had a conflict. They had a tension with that because they wanted the same view of the data. They wanted all the results in one co-located view, one, one fetch, one network call, as opposed to having to make multiple concurrent network calls, uh, possibly at the expense of bandwidth and uh, efficiency and latency. Um, uh, and not to mention battery power if you're on an iPhone or an Android, right? So all these things meant that they need some way to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to have separate services, but they want their clients uh, to be able to call just one endpoint and get all the data it needs. Not to mention, they wanted this to be fairly future-proof. So one problem that all organizations face is that as you build edge services that adapt the data downstream to the views of the need and the needs of the client, um, you have to keep adding those new views, those new endpoints with GraphQL. This is not necessarily true anymore, right? Now with GraphQL, you can have uh, the client dictate what data it needs and it can ask for the data it needs and get only the data that it needs. This makes it particularly compelling uh, for edge service use cases and data federation. Um, I wanna thank you for watching and uh, you know, as always, enjoy the episode. All right, let's build a GraphQL service. GraphQL support is relatively new in the Spring ecosystem, but it's unique in that it is uh, the first time we've built a framework that doesn't have a particular flavor of, uh, of runtime associated with it. So you need HTTP somewhere, but we don't care if you're using HTTP uh, with the Servlet API or if you're using HTTP with Netty and the, the Reactive stack. So I'm gonna add the Reactive stuff because that's what I tend to choose by default. Um, Unfortunately, at the moment, at the time of the recording, there is no GraphQL starter in here, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's here by the time you're watching this and they hopefully not too distant future. Uh, so I'm just gonna add this. I'll, ch I'll choose um, Kotlin as well. And we'll hit generate. Say so UAO GraphQL. Okay, the first things first, we need to add the GraphQL dependency. Now, of course, it's not yet GA, so I need the milestone and snapshot versions of the repository to be added to my Maven build. So I'll go back here and I'll choose this, I'll choose a snapshot there, not because I want that dependency, but because I wanna be able to copy and paste this repository configuration down here and the plugin repository configuration. And then with that done, I can Go ahead and add the GraphQL uh, Spring Boot Starter. So I'll say GraphQL Spring Boot Starter. It's an experimental dependency at the moment. Milestones. And that's it. Now in GraphQL, GraphQL is a technology that was created by Facebook in 2012. It was open source in 2015. And it has uh, this idea of a connected graph where it can do uh, where it can actually stitch together different parts of the object graph with different resolvers. Each resolver, in this case, corresponds to a handler method in the spring world. Uh, and so in order for it to work, we need to uh, expose it. So I'm gonna say GraphQL, and uh, you know I've got the GraphQL path as GraphQL, that's the default, that's fine. Uh, there's also a WebSocket endpoint, right? If you wanna do that, WebSocket path, it can be GraphQL. I like to have that enabled as well. Um, and this is very important. GraphQL uses HTTP, but it's not RESTful. There's no, there's no, it doesn't purport to be the best citizen for HTTP. Quite the contrary, you can use GraphQL with WebSockets or HTTP, and I wouldn't be surprised if one day there's support for something like RSocket. So now I've got a GraphQL application, and my application is going to create some endpoints that, mod that model and serve up different parts of my data. But of course that data has a schema. And this is one of the things I love about GraphQL is that it has a, um, 
it has an upfront schema that you have to worry about, right? That schema defines what is accessible. And that schema is introspectable. So other clients can look at that and go, oh, I know what you, I know what you're capable of. I know what endpoint you have. I know what data you return. This makes it very easy to discover and work with different APIs. All right, so let's create a query here. The query is the root object. This is kind of a well-known object in the GraphQL world. Uh, there are three different modalities, three different ways to work with a GraphQL endpoint. Uh, there's a query, which is a thing that reads data from the server. There are mutations, which update things on the server. And there are subscriptions, which are long-lived, kind of like WebSockety or RSockety um, uh, connections or queries. They're basically queries that you would serve over a, a long-lived connection, okay? So the, the query is the root for all the read operations, right? The type called query. You can have other types as well, one called mutation, one called subscription. Uh, but the only one that you really need to have to get started is query. And here I'm going to have an endpoint that returns many different customers. The brackets around the type indicate more than one of. So we need to define the type customer now. And the type customer has an ID. It has a name. Uh, and that's it for now. Okay, so now I want to create a GraphQL controller handler. Now I, want to create, now I want to create a GraphQL controller. So I'll say class greeting GraphQL controller, add controller. And so the first way we're going to do this is to create a schema mapping. And the schema mapping endpoint describes the type. In this, type, in this case, the type is query. And the field is customers. So I'm going to say customers handler is going to return a reactive stream but we need to actually provide the type here. So data class customer, val id int, val name string, okay? Good, so we're gonna say just, I'm gonna create a customer here, id and then a, okay? Customer to b. All right, good. So that's a very simple schema mapping endpoint. That the schema, the type is called query. This is the query. We're creating a handler or resolver or data fetcher. You'll see those names inter used interchangeably in the GraphQL community. So we're creating a controller handler method that acts as a resolver or data fetcher. Those two terms you'll often see used interchangeably in the GraphQL community across different clients uh, for this field called customers on the type called query. If we go to that, we can see query customers. Okay, let's try that out. Okay, we can go to localhost graph IQL. And we get this convenient little uh, editor we can use to run requests against the endpoint. And it shows me if I do control space, it shows me what data is available. I hit ID, I want the field and the name fields to come back. So there we go. There's my two records. Great. Now, uh, that was easy, right? Very easy. Okay, well, what if I want to, what if I want to get the customers by a certain name? Well, in this case, I would create a schema mapping, type name, query, and we create a new field here called customers by name. And this would be customers by name, and it takes an argument string name, okay? And so fun customers by name, argument name string equals, let's say, uh, let's say that we extracted out all of this private val db equals list of. Okay, we don't need the generic type there anymore. It's assumed. And here we're going to say this dot db dot filter it dot name. Oh, we don't actually, we don't need the filter there. We just return them all. But here we're going to say this dot db dot filter. It dot name equals name. All right. And that probably can be equals equals. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. So there's my customers by name endpoint, And that's a field on the schema.
Let's go ahead and try this request again. Good. What about by name? Let's refresh. And now it's saying, hey, you want to use the customers by name endpoint? Great. It takes a field. The field will be A. And there we go. If we do B, we get B, right? So it's very, very easy to use to send data, to get filtered views of the data, etc. Now, the schema approach, this approach to having a query that everybody uses, is so common, in fact, that there are um, annotations that are sort of meta annotations, just like the relationship between request mapping and get mapping. So instead of doing this, I can actually do query mapping. And it'll infer that you the type is query, and it'll infer that the name of the field is customers by name by the name of the controller handler method. So in this case, I can replace both of these thusly. Okay, so it's exactly the same thing, just cleaner. Okay, there we go, no problem. Now, the last thing I might want is order data associated with my schema, right, with my customer. So maybe I have a type called orders, and it has an ID and a customer ID, and I want a collection of orders given order, all right? So there is that. So I'm gonna return a collection of orders. And uh, in order to solve that, I'm gonna use schema mapping again, because a qu query mapping is a special case for the type it named query. But if your type is named customer, in that case, you need to use schema mapping. So customers, and you know, here, you don't need to specify the field. I just did that last time. Okay, so the I'm going to use, I'm going to re, I'm going, this is a resolver that will stitch together the whole picture of the customer. But in order to do that, in order to get all the uh, order data, I need to, uh, I need to have a reference to the customer. So I'll say then return a list of, let's say orders, and the data for orders will look like this. It'll say data class order val id int val customer id int and I'll be returning order and the first parameter is of course the id and then customer.id two is this one and then three is that one etc right there's my list of orders uh, and I don't need to specify the field again it's assumed go ahead and hit re request if I want the customer data and the order data, I can refresh the page. The schema has now been loaded by the client. You can see that that's there as well. It has an ID and a customer ID field. Right? By the way, you don't need the commas. I just do that because I'm used to it, but it's not required by any stretch. And I can get that as well. Right? So there's the orders for each of the customers. And I've only got one customer in this case. If I, did, if I look for all of the customers, and I don't have a, there's no parameter here, there's no arguments, so all the customers, I get back all the customers for all the orders. Now that is two different processes or two different operations on the server side. First, I'm getting all the customers and then for each customer, I'm getting all the orders. And that results in two, that results in two different handler methods being invoked. But that's okay, because at least I'm getting the response and it invokes them. If you return a reactive type, uh, it'll invoke them concurrently because the reactive type is async. So if you, if you say I have, uh, I need to call this other microservice that has the order data, and you use the reactive web client or the rsocket requester, uh, you'll get back a reactive stream, a flux of T, and you can return that flux of T from this orders handler method. Uh, and that'll, that'll result in those calls being done in a concurrent fashion. So you're getting all the customers and then concurrently calling the order service 10 different times. All right, this has been a quick look at GraphQL. Obviously I have a, another video on that one you can look at for more details and you can see subscription mapping and mutation mapping. But as you can see, it's very similar to what we've looked at before. You can do exception mapping, you've got annotations, you've got uh, all that kind of stuff. So this is very, very powerful. All right, Spring fans, what'd you think of that? We learned about GraphQL in this, as I said before, we've already rehashed the larger sort of story around GraphQL before, so I'll definitely defer you to that particular video for the bigger picture. And bear in mind that even since we recorded this installment, uh, there has been a new release of Spring GraphQL with new features like at batch mapping. So uh, if you have an N plus one, you can say, I want to, for every 
thing, every part of the graph that has to be resolved, that would be an n plus one kind of collect, uh, fetch. For every one of those, give me all the IDs and I'll return them all in one fell swoop. So it's just at batch mapping and it's super convenient, right? This kind of stuff is great. Um, obviously, I hope you got something out of this. If you did, please like and subscribe. We are always happy to, uh, to, to see that people are interested. Let me know what you thought in the comments. And we'll be back next week to wrap up our series looking at all things at controller. Thanks so much and stay tuned and see you next week.